Let's go back where God led us in on yesterday and see what we can do to help improve our learning. This is the word of God. This is my word from God. Obedience to this word is the only weapon that I have. If I read this word, according to the book of Joshua chapter number one, I will prosper. I will prosper in every area of my life. I can be what this word says I can be. I can do what this word says I can do. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for revealing your word to me today. Please, please, as you're on your feet, just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord, I thank you today for all that I've experienced. I thank you for the rough times as well as the smooth times. But now, Lord, during your time, I want you, in Jesus' name, to fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can receive this word without distraction or disruption. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. And so in the book of Acts, the 12th chapter, the 8th and 9th verse, we have learned that there was a preacher that was preaching God's word. Now, this preacher wasn't just a normal guy preaching. He was the same guy a few years, a few uh, weeks earlier, who had said that he did not know Jesus, although he was handpicked by Jesus. Teenagers, young people, young adults, listen to me. I want to really specifically kind of talk to you tonight. When you stand up and say to the Lord, I'm on your side, always remember that Satan will launch a different kind of an attack on you. He, he doesn't just necessarily want to attack you. He wants to attack you so that when you come back, no one wants to listen to you. Now, that was important. That was really important. I may not have been important to anybody but me, but um, it's, it's, it's if you just get it by hearing what I say. Now, when I was younger, the words attacked, that stuff really didn't mean a whole lot to me. I didn't know what that meant, really. It, those were kind of like church words. I don't even think growing up I heard the word attack. I think I heard the word devil, and um, de I don't know if I heard much about demons. Um, it was just bad, and, and most of the time, Growing up, I, I was always taught or heard in church that it was God doing bad for people. And when God got mad at you, he just did something. Mess with your spine or mess with your eyes or, you know, gave you a haircut or anything. You know, he was just punishing you. So we, we had a fear for God and not a faith for God. We had a fear of God. We didn't, we didn't, um, a lot of us didn't really want to have any parts to do with God because God was, a, God was a guy that you got in trouble with and he did permanent damage to you. And so we had to learn, according to reading the word of God, that Satan will do those things just to make God look bad. Are you all with me now? So this guy's in jail, and according to the book of Acts, his name is Peter, and we learned yesterday, and we just got to keep talking about it. We've got to keep talking about this. We've got to keep talking about it. We've got to keep talking about it. Because sometimes when God is speaking to us the way he's talking to us in this church, that sign says, God will provide. Somebody in here right now is in handcuffs. Your finances are in handcuffs. Your job is on lockdown. Your degree is locked down. You're going to the next level. Your graduating is locked down. And tonight God wants you to know that in spite of whatever that is, the devil will not have the last say so. Let me say this. Don't ever regret being a Christian. Don't ever deny being a Christian. Well, I'm not denying it. I'm not regretting it. Yeah, but sometimes when you go through those tough times and you decide, well, I'm going to do what's best for me. I'm not going to church. I'm not going to have to sit there and listen to that. I, I got other things that are important also. Also, sometimes don't put also in the category of world and church. There are always other things to do. And even if you put also there, make sure that you're not misleading someone to make them think that God is not number one. 
So the angel came to get this guy out of jail because he was overloaded. He was overloaded with pressure. He was, he was going to get killed in the morning. And now we can we, see when you understand the sermon a little bit more and the preacher starts talking about it again, you go, oh, okay, now I'm starting to pull it all together. Sometimes the sermon sounds good because you heard it one time and it meant something one time. But then God starts to break it down a little bit more and that same message, you start to understand why it was put in print. And while you'll hear it again next year or five years from now or 10 years from now or during your next presentation, you'll use it in your examples. So this, this, this guy, Peter, who is a believer, now this is the, this is the part that makes being locked down and, and in jail and in trouble. This is what makes it so difficult. He is a believer. He's the, he's the head preacher. He's the one that Jesus said, you're going to lead the church into a new direction. This is not a guy who's thinking about preaching. He's been preaching. And man, he's been, he's been having people have been converted. Their lives are being changed. And, and the kings are saying, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of them said, he's doing too much. We're going to have to kill him. Because earlier, he said he didn't know Jesus. Now, he's preaching Jesus. So he's really trying to take advantage of people, take their money, work on their emotions. He's not who he says he is. And every one of you in here, there are people that you have dealt with that now that you're a Christian and you go back and try to tell them about Jesus, they don't believe you. Because you were so strong in your disbelief. You were so loud in what you did in the world. And when you became a Christian, Satan said, shut it down. And I'll tell you about this word, young people, that I want you to understand that we cannot allow to happen in our lives. So anyway, so the angel uh, shook Peter and, and got him up. So Peter was sleepy, and we learned the word yesterday that we're not going to use tonight. The word is hairy, but we learned the, the root word from the Hebrew language called hair up. And he shook him and said, hair up. And then, and then the handcuffs fell off his wrist. See, I could, man, I could... You got to get shook pretty hard for handcuffs to fall off. And if it weren't for a little bit of arthritis and some medical issues sitting in the audience, I would have you right now to shake somebody so something fell off. But we'd have all kind of fights break out in this church, wouldn't we? <laughs> but the angel shook him. See, it's one thing when you know who's shaking you. But when God sends somebody to shake you, Things just fall off. So anyway, the handcuffs did what? They just fell off. So they must have still been locked or something. Fell off his wrist. And the angel said, get dressed. And we spent a lot of time talking about clothes yesterday, how important that was. Then he said, put your shoes on. And then Peter obeyed him. Didn't see him, just heard him. He knows that he's going to get, he's gonna get killed in, in a few hours. And something shakes him, handcuffs fall off his hands, and then something says, get your clothes on and put your shoes on. Listen, if you shake me hard enough to knock handcuffs off, you should have shook me right through the door. Naked and all, I don't care, I'm just out of here. But to be, <laughs> I gotta, but to be shaken up so that shackles fall off. And then, and then the Holy Spirit, the Lord starts putting order to it. The, the biggest issue that we sometimes have as Christians is we like the fact of being free, but we don't like responsibility. We don't like to take orders. We like to give them, but we don't like to take orders. And, and here's the deal. Once you learn that people will do what you say, then it becomes difficult for you to do what someone else says. Peter was in charge. He was the rock. The angel said, get dressed and put your shoes on. Put your shoes on. Where, was, where were his clothes? And in jail, why did he get so comfortable he had to take his clothes off to go to sleep? <laughs> See, oh, we could go on with this for another hour and a half. And when and y'all been in jail before, you did what'd you do with your shoes? <laughs> Were, were your shoes just right under you? And if there are other people in jail with him, whose shoes did he put on? Why did, did he put on these? 
Remember yesterday we talked about, did he put on these? Did he put on these? His shoes said a lot about where he was going. Look at the person's shoes next to you. Look at them. Some people have shoes with just enough room for that big toe to get out of. At least that's what you meant when you put them on. But now that toe is squeezed and made room for that second toe. Some people in here don't have on any shoes. If you're sitting in church right now, you're taking your shoes off, raise your hand. Country, country, country. That's the country people. So, so he's telling him, and I'm telling you why this is in the word. Because when God shakes you, he wants you to get ready to go somewhere. And shoes are an indication that we're going to start moving. We're going on a journey. It's important to God how we're dressed. It's important to God how we look when people see us. They needed to know that Peter didn't break loose. He was let loose. You're getting this with me now, right? And so we talked about that. Now, here's the point we're going to go into tonight. He said, then grab your coat. I think yesterday, at the end of the message, we talked about that. He put his coat on. Now, you know... <laughs> I'm so glad there wasn't a scripture in here that said, comb your hair, put your chapstick on. <laughs> Peter is going through a lot for a man who's been locked up. But God is saying, everyone in this room, don't get so caught up in asking me to release you. Follow my instructions. That's why we're here in Monday school tonight. I don't understand why the children have to come and sing. Because your children are going places. Some of you don't understand who you're raising. You brought them in here, but they're God's vessels. And if they learn responsibility right now, do you know what sitting up in church, not falling asleep, did to me as a young person? Falling asleep in church when I was young almost got me a permanent crook in my neck. I learned how to pay attention in church. That's why I asked them to come back and sit with their parents, sit with you. Sometimes it, you need to know how your children behave when an adult is speaking. You want to go to the school with your... Want the teacher to respect you and you going up there in your pajamas and your flip-flop. I want to talk to the principal. Dressed like Cinderella in that, what you doing? When did pajamas become church attire? I mean school attire. Told him to put his coat on. I'm trying to get all this. You can tell I'm trying to get all this. And then he said, let's go. Now, key word. Start listening to the Bible. You hear God speak to you in just a word at a time. He didn't say get out. What do you say? Now, the reason let's is important is because unless Peter is led, he's about to look suspicious. Let's go means I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Let's go means I'm not going to do you like you did Jesus. Oh, 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 that was a cut. That was a cut to the gut. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do you, who said you loved him, but then when it came time to showing you loved him, backed out. No, no, no. I'm straight from God. Let's get out of here. And Peter, here's the message tonight. You, you ever want your child to, anybody here ever parent ever wanted your child to um, move a lot faster than they move? You, you know how to do that, don't you? You go. Just start going. Just start moving. Just start moving and start turning off lights. I, I 
think we, sometimes we just, we bargain too much. Come on, you're going to make me let. All it takes is being left. One. <laughs> These are horrible instructions. Don't write this down. Y'all, it's not against the Bible to tell your kids to hair up. Those were angelic instructions. Hurry. Well, I think that's abusive. I think, oh, hush. If your child is going somewhere, it's time for you to tell your child, get in a hurry. Let's go. But are they delaying sometimes because we delay? Who has to make you give God an offering 90 days with a bargain? Now it ought to be a lifestyle. Once God has proven himself, it ought to be a lifestyle. But it is amazing. There are those who will start out for 40 days of prayer, 90 days of a challenge, 60 days of witnessing. And as soon as God allows us to prosper, we slow down. But now he says, put your clothes on and follow. Guess what Peter did? He obeyed and he followed. And the process started for Peter on his journey. And we have to keep our faith awake. Because when the Lord shakes us and tells us to move, we've got to keep moving. Now, remember yesterday, and I just want to hit it real fast. So if you may, you may not have time to get the notes, but, but I want you to, you know, get the DVD later. Remember what's bothering him now. Peter's been locked up for a while. Peter's a preacher. Peter is doing the right thing, and he's locked up for the right thing. He's persecuted for righteousness' sake. So I'm not just saying you go out and bust up a neighborhood and do something bad that you shouldn't be locked up. Peter was doing what God said, but then shame took over. Shame can take over sometimes. And we, we, had, a, we had a big discussion about this. Young people, look at me in the face a little bit. Don't let shame hold you back. I'm shamed. I can't read well. I'm shamed. I can't do math. I'm shamed. I stutter. I'm shamed. I'm not as tall as everyone else. I'm shamed. I have braces. I'm shamed I was born with a limp. I'm shamed I have a difficult birthmark. I'm shamed I have speech issues. I'm shamed my teeth are not as straight as the other children. I'm shamed I can't wear shorts. I'm shamed my legs are too little. My legs are too big. I'm shamed my shoes are broken. I'm shamed my clothes are ragged. Shame, shame. In this room right now, there are adults and 90% of the people that come in and say we love the Lord are ashamed of how God made us. All your life, you're trying to change something that is not going to change. That's who you are. But shame will tell you that you will never be fit for what God created you to be. Shame because you're too black. Shame because your hair is yellow. Shame because your hair is too straight. Shame because your hair is a little tighter and curlier on the end. They call it the edge up. I call it the end. Does anybody understand what I mean? And we sit in here and we're, we're a unit. We can say this tonight. But things happen and you get shame. You, you act a monkey in church. Now that's just a phrase I picked up from the 19th. You know, your mom and dad, you stop acting a monkey. <laughs> See, there are phrases that we grew, grew up with. That one just came out by accident. I really didn't mean to say acting a monkey. And so, you, you're even an adult, you act a monkey in church, you say some things you didn't mean to say, and then when you say it, Satan puts you in a position to clown. He made, you, he made you say some things you didn't mean to say, act in a certain funny way that he brought up from your past, and now you're shamed. Could you stand up and read a, do a prayer for us? I'm shamed. Can you stand up and read the scripture? I'm, I'm shamed. Can you stand up and give a testimony? I'm shamed. Why? Because Satan keeps reminding you that there was a time when you were in handcuffs. Your speech has you in handcuffs. Your reading abilities have you in handcuffs. Oh, y'all listen to me, young people. We're going to pray in a minute. We're going to go home. Sometimes it's okay for people to know that you have a deficiency. It's okay for somebody to know that you can't get it right. And that's when God sends you help. You see, if Peter was not locked up, I don't care what the angel would have shaken. He still wouldn't have followed him. Peter could have said, I'm all right. I like, I like being locked up. 
And some people have gotten used to being locked up and you don't know you need to be free. Shame tells you that's who you are. No one is supposed to read. No one is supposed to be able to write. Everybody can't do math. Everybody can't speak. He'll tell you all those things just to keep you in shame. And then once you stay in shame long enough, you develop this key monster called jealousy. And now you're ashamed of yourself because everybody seems to be better than you, even people who are way beneath you. That's what shame will do. Shame will have you to walk in a room and not speak because you don't think your words are going to flow right. I've been there before. I've walked into a room of people that I knew were overqualified in every area of life. And I thought, I better back up and I can't get in this conversation. And the Holy Spirit said, bring your conversation. Your story is important to everything they're going to say. But shame will tell you you don't fit in. Shame will keep your hands down when you know God is good. Shame will take away your hallelujah and you'll just rock your head. You better rock your head and raise your hand and lift every voice. Shame will tell you how dare you act saved when you know you have sinned. Shame keeps us connected to the sin of the past. Look at someone right now and say, everybody's done wrong. Say, but I've been forgiven. No, 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 say, but I've been forgiven. In other words, everybody smells bad. But the reason I said I've been forgiven, you can't speak for everybody taking a shower. Shame, it paralyzes you. It takes away your power. It makes you act drunk. It, it, it clouds your mind. Shame will have you, there's a word that, that, that we used to use, shame will have you tripping. There's nothing wrong with you except you're just shame. And when you walk around with shame, you had a baby before you got married. And when you delivered the baby, you should have delivered yourself from the shame. I used to wouldn't tell kids that, that I didn't know my father. Why? Shame. Shame of who? All the other kids who were lying about their fathers. You missed that. You missed that. I wanted to be like them and I was. Without a father. But they lied about it. Making me feel what? Shame. People who live in shame are forever attached to the past. Young person, listen, if you failed that test last year, if you failed that test three times, don't stay attached to it. Sometimes it takes longer to succeed and it always takes longer to be a king. You don't become a king because people say so. You become a king by killing one giant at a time. Every time David moved up, he had to kill something. What are you willing to kill next? Last semester you killed math. This semester killed English. I remember one semester when geometry killed me. It was homicide. I thought to myself, it makes no sense in the world to take geometry. And my geometry teacher was Mr. My geometry teacher was Reverend Walton. Now that first couple of times in geometry, I just let it go. That's what we call fail. I just let it go. And I was the kind of kid in school, oh, no, 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 no. You were not going to give me a 98 on anything. If it didn't say 100, you need to take it back. Mr. Teacher. But geometry, I've never been so glad to see a 63. I'm sitting in class and I probably failed most of it because everybody was taking it serious. I'm trying to be funny in class. Because see, when you don't get something, you try to be funny with it. 
So I told the teacher one day, I remember this, this was for real, this, almost got, this got me in a lot of trouble too. So I said, you know how this started, don't you? He said, uh, no, he was going through all the theories of, of side, angle side, and, and uh, the PC, CPCTC, which is concurrent parts of concurrent triangles. I could, see, did see what I didn't get it. And so he kept talking, and then I said, no, I'm going to tell you how, how it happened. See, one day this man went outside, and he planted a seed. And then when the seed grew up, it had different sides and angles, because I was trying to explain it to the class sides and angles and it grew and it had some squares and and all the things on the tree were trying to connect with the roots and then all of a sudden the seed looked up one day and said gee i'm a tree <laughs> gee i'm a tree and so get out of my class mr rush i was trying to get the class on my side gee i'm a tree y'all don't get it either huh that's all them south Oak cliff kids <laughs> And we talked yesterday about the solution to shame. You don't ever have to be shamed that there are some things that you cannot accomplish that are not a part of your gift package. It's just, it's just what you can't do. If you can't run a hundred yard dash and win first, walk the hundred yard dash and finish it. The greatest sporting event that I've ever watched, and I love watching sports all the time, the greatest sporting event that I ever watched is called the Special Olympics. Boy, you want to laugh? Watch the Special Olympics. And you know why you laugh? Because the whole time they're competing, they're laughing. You, something's wrong with you if you watch the Special Olympics and break down. <laughs> Those kids, those grown-ups have no idea that they are different because everyone walking and running with them have the same condition, confidence. Confidence. We have a group in this church and we organized the reason we organize it was because of the Special Olympics. And in the Special Olympics, they don't try to win first place. They just finish. And sometimes when they start running, one will take off to the left, one will take off to the right, one will just stand there, some will spin. Sort of like a fourth grade basketball game, four-year-old basketball game. They just do all kind of things out there. But at the finish line, and, 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 the, and you could, they have like a 50-yard dash, and it may take, you know, one of you young people, four seconds to run a 50-yard dash or five seconds. It might take one of those kids in Special Olympics 10 minutes. And just because the first, second, and third place finisher comes in, doesn't affect that fourth place or that fifth place person. Because at the finish line, there are people with their arms wide open. You know what those people are called? Encouragers. And so the job is not to come in first. The job is to come in touch. Come in touch with the person who's there to say, you finished it. And when one gets confused, the encourager will go a little bit closer and just welcome them in. And when they get done, they embrace them and hug them. And you see all kinds of parents clapping. These parents have been waiting for an hour for that person to finish. They have no shame. I watched the finals of the, and I never knew we had a, I think it's called Paralympics, if I didn't get the name wrong. There was an Olympics in our um, World Olympics where they have people that have disabilities and, and you have um, People, of course, that play basketball in wheelchairs, people that swim with no legs, uh, blind people who ran uh, events. It was amazing. Every, everything that people that are able-bodied could do, they did in the Paralympics and more. I never, I, I, I was just amazed. But I didn't see one person who was shamed. Yet all of us in this room have the ability to do more than one thing. Yet you're ashamed of your hips. You're ashamed of your feet. You're ashamed of your nose. You're ashamed of your features. You're ashamed of things that have been with you all of your life. 
And God just said, do you have the ability to follow me? You know I'm not one that is a component of people not trying to improve. That's what we do every day. But sometimes the one area that you really need to improve in is the area of being proud that God has accomplished something in your life. I got something for you. If it had not been for cigarettes, some of you never would have stopped smoking. If it had not been for alcohol, you would not have been sober. What am I saying? There are some things that you are terribly ashamed of that are still there and now you're in front of it. And because Satan knows where that vice is, where that weakness is, he'll use that thing to keep calling you back. Your temper is not as bad as it used to be because you know who and who not to fool around with. <laughs> Remember, you used to just go off on anybody. <laughs> now you can, hey, hey. We learned that, uh, is this, this, young people, y'all getting it? I want you to stand in those tests this week or the next couple of weeks. You that are graduating, I don't care what the challenge is. Walk in there. Sit in those seats. If you don't know the answer to number one, go to number two. If you don't know the answer to number two, go to number three. If you don't know the answer to number three, four, and five, ask the person next to you. <laughs> so, amen. <laughs> That's not good instructions from the man of God. That'll get you locked up in jail right there, what I just said. So forgive me, please. But have you ever sat in the test and been ashamed to take the test because you knew that you didn't know any answers? Teacher gave you the answers six weeks ago but it didn't seem to make any sense until the day of the test. The Bible says the solution to shame we learned was to just say, Lord, I messed up and I'm telling you about it. And I know that you will cleanse me from all this unrighteousness. And you have to take tests, by the way, the rest of your life. I'm so glad, I'm so glad if I were preaching, I would, I would hum this, I'm so glad that we don't have to take a shower pill. I'm so glad you got to get up in some water. Amen. I, if they ever come up with a shower pill, y'all, let's not take it, okay? In, in agreement, let's turn to each other and say, I'm not taking it. No, if that person's ignoring you, get their attention right quick. There are some things we just have to go through, right? Some of y'all not in agreement. I'm getting a little nervous. <laughs> He's so busy. I'm just, I need a shower. It'd take that thing 45 minutes for you to get clean if it did work. The reason I'm bringing this up and it's so crazy for us to talk about it is because every day you will enter into some unrighteousness. And it should make you shame. It should make you confident to know that God will clean you up. We live in a sinful world, y'all. If you walk into a room and somebody's been smoking marijuana, it's going to get on you. As long as it doesn't get in you, you're all right. I, I said as long as it, I, I should have had a bigger amen than, <laughs> boy, I'm telling you, uh, <laughs> y'all look like I just made that up. Uh, <laughs> now, I know what that means because I have been in environments where I didn't smoke any marijuana, but I was around people that did, and folk tend to judge you by what the outside is. Somebody's un got on my righteous. And I walked around smelling. 
But they didn't, they didn't believe I was unrighteous unless I started walking around in shame. When you deal with people in the world, sometimes their attitudes, you can be on a conversation with somebody every day. You keep hearing the same people complain all the time. You're going to get off and you're going to start complaining. You get around people who fuss a lot, you're going to just start fussing. Sometimes you need to stop waking yourself up and going to bed with people that just fuss. Because their arm gets on your righteous. And then you go to bed and you start having arguments in your dream. And then you wake up mad at yourself, biting your lip. What's wrong with you? <laughs> right? You have to take that shower. Wash it off. We just have to review this tonight. All right. So now we learned that. And then we learned, according to the book of Colossians, really quick, that sometimes we've been alienated uh, in our minds. You, you're, not, you're, not, you're not separated from God because Satan will tell you that shame makes you separated from God. And, and young people, I want to talk to you specifically today. And parents, we know this from yesterday, so help us talk with our kids about it. Just tell them, baby, sometimes it's just in your mind. Now, kids do talk about you. They, they, they do make fun of you. They do call you fat. They do call you silly. They do call you dumb. They call you a lot of names. They talk about your mama. They talk about your daddy. They say things. And I've always told you, it's not what they call you, it's what you answer to. Kids will find a way to make you respond. We, we, that's how we look. I, I got almost amazed when I found out the children were taking that personally. That's how we grew up. I don't know how you spell it, but we called it going. I don't know how we, oh Lord. It was just going, not going, mm -mm, it's going. And whoever scold the most, <laughs> hey, it's always a kid though that'll say something that was true. Oh. See, and if they ever saw your parents coming to the school, oh, no, you're not going to talk about me. Your mama just came up to the PTA meeting. And one of her legs was short. They called her Eileen. You know, so, oh, because they saw your mama. And so, this is not church talk. I'm just telling you that. That was. But see, they started messing with your what? Mine. Satan will bring up stuff that you know happened. And he's messing with your what? Mine. And you separate yourself. He tells you when you walk in church, look at how they're looking at you. All of them know it. All of them know what you did. And you walk in shame. He knows how to mess with your mind. Don't think that you won't walk in a room full of people. Room full of people. And you will think that every one of them in there are talking about you. It's time for you to get shook. It's time to go. That stuff will handcuff your mind. Sin does not have the ability to make us stop loving, make God stop loving us. It does not have the ability to do that, but Satan will tell you that. Now, it does have the power to affect your thoughts and make you feel separated from God. Why am I doing all of this? And we did this yesterday because now it becomes important because now, 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 now Peter is following the angel. See, all this stuff is good church talk, and I can go over these notes again over and over and over and over, and I think I'll put this in a category of favorite messages. Because once you start following Jesus, Satan starts bringing up stuff that happened before you start following him. And so you'll start like this. you start out like, oh, hallelujah, and then somebody from your past will come up, or they'll email you, or they'll talk, and then your walk slows down. Because shame catches up with you. And starts messing with your mind. I know this is some good talk. I know God is talking good tonight. And why is that important? Because it doesn't come up until you start following Christ. Young people, Satan is not going to fool with you until you tell somebody, I am saved. You have the same issues that every other adult in here had in school. We got in trouble. Only difference is they took away the paddle. They took away the switch. They took away the pinch. And I think the pinch was worse than all of them. The pinch was a silent assassin. 
No, the pinch will get you out of a seat and put you back down. Oh, oh y'all don't know about the pinch. I knew about the pinch. My mama could pinch me and had no fingernails. They didn't have fingernails in old days. They have fingernail files right in your mouth. But she would pinch and I would get up and it was a... It was and look like this if you want to. Make that face, straighten that face up. You had to like that pinch. But all of us had those problems in school. Light-skinned kids, I say it all the time, y'all had it easy, cause y'all had bruises. That was state evidence. Dark-skinned kids, we had ash. How you gonna get ash on your shoulder? The pinch. And some parents could do it so effectively, they never looked at you. They just, mm, mm, and just kept looking, amen, hallelujah, hey. Mm. You went through a whole transformation and they never moved. And I'm like, preacher, look at her, come on, there's the devil over here. Sorry, I, got, I went back. Pray for me, I need deliverance out of that thing. Now, kids ball their fist up, buck at a parent. <laughs> See, that'll get you nine to ten. <laughs> Teeth knocked out. <laughs> and the horrible thing is now I pass through all over the world, people who walk in church shame because you have to cross the line one day between your, you raising your child or your child breaking you. Our parenting skills have changed. And now we have to learn a new way. Just coming down late now on the phone with the mom. Today, today, you want to take your children tonight. The state does. The laws have changed. And if the state has to take your children because you don't understand this other level of parenting because there have been abusive parents, not loving parents, but abusive parents who have hurt children and killed children and got away with it. But you can't walk around with shame because you loved your child. You loved that child so much. Some, some things you just did, your, your child had an accident right while you were there, and you're shame. Some of you have lost children. You were the best parent you could be, and you still carry the shame. Satan calls it guilt and shame. <laughs> because what guilt is, is shame that has been buried and baptized so that it now saturates you, so that when you come up, you're soaked in it. And it doesn't matter what you put on, shame penetrates whatever garment you wear. You're on your best dress day of your life and you can't get your smile right because shame is there. You said I would never stop, no, when I, I, I'm never stop, I'm never gonna stop coming to church, I don't care how busy I get, I don't care how much money I make, I don't care what, Hey, nothing's gonna make me stay away. And then it happens, something happens. And now you say, I can't go back because I've been gone too long. Shame, because when I go back, I know they're gonna ask me, where you been? And shame will tell you, you've got to tell them the truth or tell them a lie. And in reality, you don't have to tell us anything. But Satan will get in your mind. And everybody who comes up and shakes hands and says, hey, good to see you this morning. Y'all act like I don't go to church. You get that? But if nobody does anything, you'll leave saying, nobody said nothing to me the whole Sunday. Is this making sense to anybody?
Keep following him. When you get out of the prison, keep following him. You have to keep following him. You have to keep following the angel. Keep following Jesus. Everybody in this room, keep following. Young person, keep following. We have to keep our faith awake. The angel shook him up. Said, let's go. You've been shaken up. There you go, brother. Wake him up. You had to wake up your faith. It was sleep. You have to keep your faith awake. And then, 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 you're going to have to, in order to keep following the Lord now, you're going to have to release your frustration. Because this, this thing will chase you around all of your saved life. Your praise will be frustrated. Thank you, Jesus. That's a, who you mad at? I mean, what? I understand that, you know, but some of y'all never been in church and watched those praise contests. That's right, show is. Preach it right now. You get through preaching, you go home with a sore throat just from serving the Lord. What's up? Nothing. Nothing. I'm all right. But you got to release your frustration. And then you have to work on your attitude. Ooh, you're out of prison now. You're following the angel. You're going to do something for God. I'm talking to Peter. Now you watch him. You're doing something for God. Young people, parents, young adults, older people, all of us, we got to work on our attitudes. There's nothing wrong with sitting next to someone in church. You're following Jesus now. Occasionally we have someone who has to sit in a different section. We understand that, man. You can sit in the balcony if you want to. There's nothing wrong with that. You just, just can't get up there. But we're working on our attitudes. Who wants to follow us when we follow Christ with an attitude? Where are you going? Church. <laughs> what y'all having? Nothing. Wake your faith back up. And I'm not talking to children now. It's, let me say this. I thank God for the children we have. Because our children, are, they, just, they seem to always love being in church. I love being able to be around them. We love fellowshipping and having a great time. But sometimes after we get a little older, y'all, you start acting like you miss being learned. And, and we just have to keep working. on. Peter was not a boy. He was a man. Check out the average attitude in church right now. See how many of those attitudes are teenagers and see how many of them are adults. Just check it out. We have to also maintain a heart of gratitude. Are we as grateful as we used to be? We have to maintain that. The handcuffs are off. Let's keep being grateful. Repeat after me. Let's keep being grateful. You have to maintain a heart of gratitude. Because once we start being, you know, blessed and we're out of prison, I'm out of my shackles. He loosed my shackles and he set me free. Came along beside me and gave me victory. You know, all that. I'm so glad I'm not in geometry. So, yeah. Stop. <laughs> but but just, just keep remembering these things now. Keep your, make your faith wake up. You got to tell your faith to wake up. Sometimes you get a little down. You get some bad news. Tell your faith, wait, well, hey, wake up. Come on. God still provides. We still have the same God. Right, everybody? Wake up. Wake up. But, I'm going to have to go back to this. He said, wake up. He got him up. The angel shook Peter and got him up. Peter was asleep. Wake up. Wake up. Tell your faith to get up. We're getting ready to go somewhere. Get dressed. Are y'all getting it? There we go. There we go. When you go in that interview and you know you don't have all the qualifications and you got a bad resume, walk in there and tell your faith, wake up, wake up. Don't go in here with me to sleep. You better walk in here like we got this thing. Hello there, how are you? And then say something good about them. That's a very wonderful tie you have on. You guys have a, such a nice layout here and I love the building. I love the, the detail you place in the building. Say, your faith will make you start complimenting people instead of wanting to be complimented yourself. Wake it up. Make people glad that you walked in the room. When they see you coming, they know things ought to change. Tell your faith to wake up. Stop acting all dead and tired. You're not dead, even if you are retired. 
Make children know how great it is to be 30 or 40 or 50 or 60. And let them be surprised that you've been resurrected from the dead. Tell them, I used to be dead. Tell your faith, wake up. Why? Because God has shaken us the handcuffs. Raise your hands right quick. See, no handcuffs. You get what I'm saying? Okay, you can put them back down. No handcuffs. No handcuffs. Now, everyone in this room, you know and I know that you didn't take them off. God sent something into your life that shook them off. It is amazing how many men in this room love to lift weights, but you can't even lift your own hands. This is a very simple, simple illustration of how heavy you are and nothing is on you. Most people will go and work out so that externally we can get complimented on how we look. But if you look real close, the weights are all over you. And sometimes, come here, guy. We're not satisfied. Put that one on there. If you put that one on there. Oh, yeah. Now we got to add some weight. I'll tell you what, take that off. No, leave it on there, leave it on there, leave it on there. Okay, come here, baby. Hurry up, come on. Real quick. Either one of y'all. You come on, babies. I need the fat. Hurry up. There you go. I need the hurry up one. I need the axe one. There you go. Now, I want you to lay on that little bench. Mm-hmm. Any way you please. I would do the examples, but it, I don't do this no more. Now, put your feet on the ground. Well, I guess you could. Can you lift that? Have you ever tried it? Mm. She can just look at it and tell, I can't do this. What she fails to realize is I would never ask her to do something that I haven't provided for her to do. Put your hands on these two sides right here. Uh, put your feet on the side. Well, okay, yeah. Okay, there you go. Just get relaxed. Pull your head back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to lift this. When I say lift it, ready? Lift it. Okay, put it in front of you. Put it down on your chest. Lift it up. Down. Now I want you to make noise like it hurts. No loud noise. Okay. Do it again. Again. Now put it back. Oh man. Whenever God notices that there's a weight on you, he has goodness and mercy. He is never going to ask you to lift anything without his assistance. But you got to follow him. You got to hurry up. Now let me show you what you missed in slow motion. Go back to your seat. Let me show you what you missed in slow motion. Now, I'm going to call you back again, okay? All right. Ready? Come. Slow motion. See, this is us lagging. Sit down. She chilling. She got to go see her boyfriend first. She got to go do her hair first. God already provided. And when the Lord says hurry, he means move because your help is there. By the time she gets here, now she can't do it. Why? Because she jived around so much that her help is gone. You need to wake your help up because the just shall live by faith. We can't live anything without God. Wake your faith up. Release your frustration. Work on your attitude and maintain a heart of gratitude. Building yourselves up in expectation. Now, go back to your seat again. Now, see, she knows, she knows what to have. Go back to your seat. Now, this time when I say hurry up, watch her attitude. Because when you build yourself up in expectation, she realizes, oh, I've done this before. Yeah. 
Get that. Mm, 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 mm. You get that. Mm, 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 mm. Mm, 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 mm. Mm, 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 mm. Get that too. Get that too. Mm, mm. Yeah, she, yeah. She need about a hundred fifty. Mm. Uh, get that one too. Get that one too. Yeah, get that one too. Yeah, get that too. Yeah. Yeah. Now lock it down. Oh, yeah. 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 Come here. Sprint. Run fast. Go back. That was too slow. That was too slow. We got to bust up out of here because God's going to let you go through the door. God's not going to let you sneak out. He's going to open the door. And when God shakes the handcuffs off, the door opens like an elevator. You just got a certain amount of time to move. Somebody say, I don't know when to move. Faith cometh by hearing. Sometimes you miss your move because you wouldn't come to church. God said, I'm going to tell you when, but you got to be where I'm speaking. Hurry up. Let's go. She's there. Help is right next to her. Get down there. Get on that back. Now I want you to lift that. Uh, ready? Ready? Up. Pick it up. Ha! Ah, take it in the front. Ha! Ah, make that noise. Ah, do it again. Yes, one more time. Okay, that sounds like labor and delivery. I don't know about that. All of a sudden, the weight doesn't matter because the help is there. She didn't ask me how much it weighed. She didn't check it all out. She was obedient and responsible. All she needed to do was don't move the weight, just make the noise. Do it again. Ah. Do it again. Ah. All God wants is the praise. Guys, you just do the praise. Sometimes you just be the one to make the noise. God said, if you make the noise, I'll lift the weight. And he will not give you any more than you can bear. You got to avoid that negative self-talk. They like them more than they like me. I'm not, I'm too, I don't have, I can't get this. We don't have, what we need is one of the, if we had, if I was able, if I, oh, hush. ever lifted this before okay have it on the sides lift it up put it over here come up does it hurt no sir do it again down it up see that's called a spotter I didn't know if she could lift it, but I knew I wasn't going to drop it. The difference is when she had all these on there, you see where I was. You, you need to start understanding that when God puts you in a position, he's got you here, he's got you covered on both sides. Sometimes you don't, you don't hear God. You just have to trust God. I'm not going to sit here and tell you guys that every time God moves, I can hear him. Most of the time, I just have to trust him. God, are you going to say anything? He said, I already said it. I told you, trust me. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Everybody in this room, let's go. There is nothing too hard for God. Some of you that's lifting an ego, some of you that's lifting frustration, that's lifting anger, that's lifting a past, 
It's a lot of stuff. And if you look in your life, you're going to see all kind of weights. Just, just different, different kinds. Just, oh, Lord. And these weights, they hurt. But if appropriately used, they can strengthen you. But you're not going to get any stronger unless you apply some strength and pressure to what already exists. Put some pressure on your faith. Put some pressure on your beliefs. Start doing some curls. Everybody? Here, right here. Let's do some curls. Put your hands right here. Start doing some curls. Ready? Go. See that? Start doing, let's do some push-ups, ready? Push up. Let's start doing some stretches. Let's start doing some sit-ups. This is God's gym. When you come to church, you ought to get a workout, right? Stop falling for all these sucker plans to lose weight. Tell somebody, I'm supposed to be gaining right now. I'm supposed to be gaining weight. And the weight that I'm gaining on is called patience. Thank you so much. A little child shall lead them. I want every young person in this room to come to the altar. Every teenager. Every elementary school person. Every junior high person. Come to this altar. And I want every believer of God in your seats before we give our offering. I want you to understand tonight that God talked to you about the struggles that you have. I want some of you to start falling in love. Can y'all hear me clearly? Because I don't, this is not some presentation. I want some of you to start falling in love with your hair with your skin color, with your feet, with your weight. And I want you to trust God with it. Every one of you in here qualify for Satan to steal from you. You know why? Because your parents love the Lord. And he's not necessarily after you. He's really after them. And if you don't understand what I mean by that, he went after Jesus to get back at God. He went after Adam to get back at God. He'll come after you to get back at your parents. Now, I don't want anybody talking at this altar. Stop playing and be still. Death is very real. Now, I want you all to say something with me. Say, I am not going to die. Not now and not like this. Remember those words. Look at me for a second. Take the camera. Don't put the camera on them because some of them are watching themselves because it's fun to watch. Now I'm, I'm pouring into you. If you don't watch it, you'll go around telling people that nobody cares about you. The average teenage call that I get is about suicide. They want to kill themselves. And what makes that so dangerous is some people think that killing yourselves is the issue. I'm going to tell you all this. Listen to me. Satan doesn't care about you. He doesn't want your purpose to come forth. When you say, I'm going to kill myself, he says, oh, let me help you do that. Because what happens is you kill a solution to a problem. If you die now, something won't be solved. But if you stay alive, God says, 
I will send help. And I don't care how heavy it is. I'll help you bear it. He says, now I'm not going to carry all of it for you because it's up to you to build yourself and build your faith. So sometimes it seems tough. Come back up here. I want to show you what she's doing. Have a seat. Grab the bar. There you go. As soon as I gave her instructions, what came to the stage? The help. I never told them to. And the only reason she's in the position to lift this now is because, listen to me, y'all. Listen, listen to Pastor now. Come on. She submitted. If you grow up as an adult and don't learn how to submit, you quit. And the bad part about quitting as an adult is you stick around like you have life, but you're dead. And you criticize everything God is doing. Y'all ever seen a zombie movie? The Night of the Living Dead stuff? When I count to three, strike me up a pose and act like a zombie. Ready? One, two, let me hear the zombie. Let me see the zombie. Three. Okay. Come on, give me that zombie move. Y'all saw Thriller. I don't want to go there, but you. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Come on, come on. Act like a zombie. You're trying to act, act like a zombie. See, that's not you, is it? Satan will tell you. Y'all, little kids, y'all sit down. Little kids, right here. If you're five through nine, sit on the ground. If you're five through nine, if you're ten, sit down. If you're eleven, sit down. Good. I'm talking about you examples back there that's too cool that Satan wants to kill you. I want y'all to know I'm talking to you now. You may not go to college, but don't die in the streets. Here's what I speak in your life. For years, your parents have worked for you. But in a few years, you're going to be working for them. You're going to be taking care of them because you're going to live. You're going to cry. Some things are going to be tough. You can go ahead and cut it off if you need to. Some things are going to get crazy. We'll just turn it down. But you're going to live. Now, the rest of you, I want you to stand back on your feet. And I want you to grab somebody's hand. We're going to pray this prayer. You walk in. Thank you, Lexi. Alex, thank you. You're going to walk in classrooms with confidence. If you don't know an answer on that paper, you got to know that help is right there when you don't need it. Walk in there with confidence. Bow your heads and I want every child in this room to repeat this prayer. Don't look at anybody, guys. Close your eyes. And for the first time in your life, man, I just want you to say these words right after me. Say, God, I have struggles to like myself. Different experiences in life, even though I'm young, have affected my self-image. I ask you to fix my broken self-image. Restore my view of myself so that I see what you see. You chose me you planned me, you knitted me together in my mama's belly, and you were happy when I was born. You love me on my good days and on my bad days, and you love me 
because I'm yours. I know that as my image is restored, my life will reflect your love and your goodness more and more. I give you all my praise. I'm a child and I'm here tonight because I submitted and I was obedient. And I know you noticed that and I know you will help me. My weights are my weight. They're not as heavy as mom and dad's, but they're still heavy to me. Help me lift them. Help me lift them. Strengthen my attitude. Help me, Lord, in those weak areas of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, go back to your seats. Let's get ready to go.